Good morning and welcome to Geneva Presbyterian Church. All are welcome here, and we mean that. All are welcome. Just as we are welcomed into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ, all are welcome through living, giving, serving, uh, and, and, and being the family of God together. So welcome here. We're glad you joined us. We have a couple announcements for you today. The first is that we'll have one of three financial forum lunches coming up beginning on May 29th. Uh, as many of you know, we're currently operating under a deficit budget. To fund the shortfall, we've borrowed from the appreciation on our endowments. Our session has made a commitment to end this practice. So we want to invite you to attend one of these three lunches, May 29th, June 5th, or June 12th, to learn about the budgeting process, what endowments are, and how they're used, and to understand more about the vision for our church moving forward. And here's another thing. You'll also be invited to give input into which ministries you believe are essential to that vision. So join us. Register in the courtyard by calling the church office or by visiting genevapress.org. Thank you. Our women's retreat is coming up on June 3rd through 5th. And so our women have produced this short video to tell you more. Ladies of Geneva, come and retreat with us for a weekend at the beautiful Luther Glen Retreat Center in the foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains in New Kuiper. The facility is self-contained with meeting room, dining room and bedrooms all in the same building, which we will have to ourselves. Not only is this a retreat centre, but also a working farm with hens, pigs, sheep, llamas, ducks and three wonderfully friendly farm dogs. Produce is also grown and used in the chef's menus. The centre provides indoor and outdoor spaces for meeting and eating and relaxing, with beautiful views across the valley. friends from Geneva. I'm so looking forward to being with you for our women's retreat next month. It's Pentecost weekend, so I'm looking forward to talking about the Holy Spirit and how we are inspired, especially as we move forward from this pandemic. It's a women's retreat, so poor Eddie can't join us and he's very jealous. But I'm fortunate to be spending the weekend with you and really looking forward to it. Let us call ourselves to worship. Alleluia, Christ is alive. Let all the people praise him. Let all creation sing with joy. Alleluia. The Psalter reading is from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. 
He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Trusting in the love of God to make all things new, let us confess our sin to God and to our neighbor. God of mercy, your command to love one another across all differences opens us up to new horizons. Yet we often respond with fear and judgment that hinders your goal for humanity. Disciple-making God, hear our confession and those we now offer in silence. May we listen to you as well. Forgive our sins, we pray, and give us a true repentance that leads to life for all creation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The forgiveness we have received in Jesus Christ is amazing. And it's because of Jesus' death on the cross for us, and through his resurrection, we see the true power of that all made real. And, it, and it's that hope that we will also be resurrected with him to live in this newness of life. It's in that hope that we can live in confidence of the assurance of the forgiveness of our sins. And so, may the hope of Christ be with you. Go. Past, pass the hope of Christ to those around you. Text, call, and tell them the hope of Christ that is made real to you today in Jesus Christ. Let us continue in our worship of God. The reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who are in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. 
At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gives them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Break the chains, Lord, deep within me. Break the chains, Lord, deep within me. Break the chains, Lord, deep within me. Set me free. pain, Lord, deep within me. Heal the pain, Lord, deep within me. Heal the pain, Lord, deep within me. Set me gospel reading for this morning comes from the gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. Listen to and for the word of God. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast. 
past beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought I know that it is finished. Oh, pure, how strong, how deep the Father's love for us. A reading from the Revelation of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Listen to and for the word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha 
and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we are grateful for these words, beautiful, haunting, troubling for some, but also so hopeful. Hopeful for what you will do, what you have done through Jesus, and what you are doing now, making all things new. And so we pray, God, that as we hear these words preached today, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, and you would read us as we together read and study and think about and ponder your word. In your name we pray. Amen. A few weeks ago, a friend told me this story about recent events at his church. A girl in their youth ministry had started dressing in a manner that some in the church thought inappropriate. She was wearing shorter skirts. Now, her fashion was part of a, a larger movement within the church where the youth were wearing things like hats or sweats or sandals in the church service, and it was causing a stir. And her skirt length was becoming the flashpoint. Now, there's something else you should know. This young woman is the pastor's daughter. So she began hearing comments from some and some of the church members between the services as she walked around. Some even repeated to her the rule that if the skirt doesn't touch the ground when she's on her knees, then, then it's too short altogether. The level of frustration with this trend was mounting on all sides. And then one Sunday in the worship service, when the, the church stood to sing a song together, the pastor's daughter heard someone behind her, trying to get her attention. She turned and saw an older woman motioning to her skirt. Her face had a look of displeasure. The young woman was furious that someone would do this during the worship service, not now of all times. She turned back around, ignoring the whole thing. And then it happened. Not 10 seconds later, she felt a tug on her skirt downwards. The pastor's daughter couldn't believe how audacious this was. That anyone would touch her or her clothing was a line too far. And so she stormed out of the service. Later that day, she told her father what happened through tears. She was ready to give up going to church altogether. She was upset at what she thought of as an older, outdated person. And so her father, the pastor, called the older woman and asked her why she would do such a thing. The older woman replied, When your daughter stood up, her skirt was bunched up and part of her backside was showing. I doubted she wanted to give a show to half the church. Now, when I first heard that story, I was blindsided by the punchline. In a world where we so often quarrel about issues that stir up our emotions, we so often push down the one emotion that Jesus himself commanded us to act upon. Love. The newness of that love wakes us out of our debate-the-issues-driven trance. This, this older woman, ever mindful of the debates about dress codes, acted out of love, even for someone who in their frustration was not quite in the mood to love her back. The friend who told me this story is the pastor of the church, and he told his daughter that whatever other older people were saying about her clothes, this older woman had done her a solid. She had acted out of love, even if his daughter didn't know it at the time. And now his daughter needed to know that she had someone at the church, someone not just in her youth group or her age. No, someone who cared more about her than issues. In our passages today, we read about a new thing that God is doing. How does the word new make you feel? Do you get excited? 
Disdainful? Interested? Frustrated? Whenever we hear about a new thing, our minds and hearts could go in a million different directions. As Christians, we are rooted in a particular tradition that spans millennia. For thousands of years, faithful followers of the God that the Bible calls Yahweh have been rooted in tradition. For some, tradition is a stifling environment where creativity, they say, is squelched. For others, it's a source of life a lifeline to faithful followers of our past, to the apostles, and and to Jesus himself. When one hears new thing, the tension amongst Christians of different kinds is palpable. And this doesn't even fall along the lines of age. I, I know plenty of younger people who are nourished by hymns and liturgy, like myself, Just as I know there are people in their 70s, 80s, and and even 90s who worship with the sounds of electric guitar and drums. In our reading from Revelation this morning, God says, See, I am making all things new. It might be helpful to understand what it means for John to say that God is doing a new thing and making all things new. In the Acts passage we heard today, it meant welcoming in those who didn't follow the typical Jewish rules of membership. One of those was to eat a certain diet called kosher. In the Acts passage, Peter scandalously says God told him that someone doesn't need to eat a kosher diet to be accepted. That was scandalous for them. No, he says all that's needed is faith. And that's what the early Christian church believed. And so the new thing in the New Testament meant welcoming those who didn't follow all the prescribed rules of membership. In other words, people didn't need to jump through hoops to be accepted. They didn't need to check off a list of rituals to be loved. They didn't need to kiss the ring of the powerful before their voice was welcomed. They didn't need to pretend to be someone else, no. And in a world of separation and segregation, as now and and much more, even much more then, people, they were told, could be welcomed into God's family through faith alone in Jesus Christ. A new thing. A shocking thing. This wouldn't have just been shocking to Jews, but to any ancient culture. Let's be honest. It's shocking to us today. In the world I live in, the world I know, unless you become part of a certain tribe in this world, a tribe of people who vote the same way, dress the same, have the same hobby, you're likely to experience demonization and made out to be an enemy and mistrusted, unwelcome, unless you prove your allegiance to the thing that a tribe holds dear. This has always been the way the world has worked and God says, see, I am doing a new thing. No longer do we make conforming to issues central to our identity. No. The new thing? What is it? Love. Jesus says, I give you a what? New commandment. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. You don't love the issues. You don't love your preferences. You don't love your opinions. No, you love people. And because love is the new thing, I can tell you that new music is not the new thing that God is doing. It's not new technology. It's not new clothing. It's not new language. It's not even new worship services. No, that's not what God is making new. 
Neither the new nor the old human ways of living really matter. Those cultural inventions, those are great. They happen, but they're not the new thing. No. It's the human that matters. It's the human we love, not the styles. It's the human we love, not our favorite music or our clothes or our ways of living. The new thing God is doing is love. So out of love, a person who prefers one style of worship music would worship in a different one. Out of love, a person who prefers a certain style of clothing be worn in a place like a church will wear those clothes to honor God and let others honor God through their clothing in other ways. Out of love, we'll, we'll bear with one another and how much we love or hate modern technology because we're across the board on that one. It's love that drives us, not opinions, not issues, not preferences. That's the new thing. Friend, it's love that welcomes a trans or non-binary person. It's love that seeks to learn and ask questions rather than making our opinions known about someone's gender or sexuality. It's love that invites that person to dinner to hear about the struggles they faced being a minority in a heteronormative world. And I know you've heard these words and you might be frustrated that I used some of these words that you're not comfortable with. But even as I say these words, it's not the words or the labels that matter. It's loving the people, no matter what word they choose to use for themselves. If a woman who was born with female body parts identifies as a man, it's love that tells you to call that person a man. Let me give you an example of something else. A few weeks back, we went through the confirmation pro uh, process with some middle school students, and we confirmed several students. A confirmation means that they confessed their faith in front of the church and became members of the church. One student was baptized, and this is where things got a little odd for some. Something happened during the bapti baptism that I've actually never seen before. I did the baptism, so as, as I ran my hands through the water, I noticed that some of the confirmation students pulled out their cell phones. As they were up front on the chancel, also called the stage, and they weren't doing it to text friends. No, they were video recording the baptism. That can seem really odd and out of place to see a cell phone out on the chancel it is. It's different. But I assure you that these students did it in love because they love their brother in Christ on the biggest day of his faith journey. And, and here's a better one. It was out of love that no one forced them to put the phones away or scolded them for having them out. It was a moment full of love for one another. God is making all things new, but it goes further than our individual actions. Yes, the same love that drives the new ways we treat each other as individuals has driven the greatest human socio-political new movements in the history of our species. Yes, that is true. Let me explain. In his book, Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World, Author Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man Tom Holland, a different Tom Holland. Tom Holland details how faithful followers of Jesus Christ over the last two millennia are directly responsible for the invention of education, health care, hospice, human rights, the separation of church and state, Freedom as a political concept, science, charity, democracy, marriage based on love and not on family alliances, and so much more. 
It is historically undeniable that faithful followers of Jesus Christ have been at the forefront of every historical movement of common good in this world, full stop. It might be true, and it is true actually, that some very awful moments of history have come through followers of Jesus Christ. But to ignore the far greater evidence of Christian goodness is just blind hatred. You see, God really is making all things new and has been since Jesus has been around. The world before Jesus was one, did you know, was one where weak people had absolutely no rights and no way to get them and no voice where life was not sacred unless you had money or power, where the foundation of politics was shaped by the base urges of sexual abuse, power-mongering, and greed. The actions of Christians who were faithful to the teachings of Jesus Christ have altered the course of human history forever. God is making all things new And it starts here, in our hearts. It starts with the intentional decision to not let issues supersede love. It starts with allowing my heart and my mind to be changed out of love. Not necessarily to be changing my opinion on an issue or or to have my preferences changed, but to change on how I see and welcome, and listen to, and care for, and love outsiders whom God has put in my life. So, who is in your life through whom God is making all things new? Is it a person from a different generation, a person from a different culture, a person whom you might think of as an enemy? Is it a person who votes differently than you, sees the world differently than you, with different values, attitudes, behaviors? What will loving that person do? What will listening to them do? What will caring for them do? Because I think it might just change the world for the better, the way Christians have done for centuries. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread, and after giving thanks to his Father in heaven, he said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same manner, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you... Eat this bread and drink this cup. Do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for these very common elements of bread and juice. And we are grateful that you do an incredibly supernatural, which in many ways is so uncommon work in each of our lives as we identify with you, O Christ, with your body given for us and your blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Christ. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, creator, redeemer, and sustainer God, for your incredible, unconditional, and always faithful love. May we identify with you, O Christ, in your walk, in your call to obedience, and for us to give our own lives away for the sake of others, as well as anticipate your second coming. We give thanks, we love you, and are grateful to be followers and participating with you in your mission of love, justice, and reconciliation. We give thanks. Amen. This is the body of Christ. Take, eat.
This is the blood of Christ, the new covenant, Christ's blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Pray with me. God, we thank you for a spot at the table. The table where you demonstrated your love for us by giving your life. And so we pray, God, for the heavenly, the godly courage and power to go and live lives of love in a world so defined by issues, so defined by division, so defined by my own way. Help me, God. Help us to live in this newness of love. Help us not to be caught up in the new versus the old, but to be caught up in what you are doing is new, and that is this love that you've stamped on our hearts through Jesus Christ. God, we pray that we would be an example in this place, in this nation, in this world, not for our sakes, but for the sake of this world to come and see true leadership, true power, true rule, and true reign, true love. God, we pray for humility. We pray for earnestness. We pray for courage to do all of these things. For those who are hurting, for those who are suffering, God, for our friends, our neighbors, our family. God, we pray for your presence to be with them, and we pray that we would also be a presence to them in these times of need. We pray for healing for those folks who are weighing heavy on our hearts, those with cancer, those with heart disease, those who are recovering from surgeries. God, we pray for your healing touch to be upon them. And Lord, we pray for our leaders, those whom we look to for this sort of uh, newness in our lives. Oftentimes we look to these human leaders that you've placed in our lives and, and look for a love that really captivates us, that captures us. God, we pray that our leaders would courageously live and lead out of love that they would stop leading and living out of stubborn pride, that they would stop living and leading and loving themselves and their ways. God, I say this for myself as a pastor. God, be with those who lead to lead, not out of a place of our own egos, out of our own pride, but to lay down our lives out of love. And so, God, we know that we can only do this through the power of your Spirit in our lives. And we pray, O oh God, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is our opportunity. Our opportunity to be generous with our lives to be generous with those things that we hold dear, those, those moments and places that we think define us and define the world. Our opportunity is to hold on to those loosely and hold on to our faith in Jesus that builds in us the capacity for self-giving love. That's our opportunity today. And as you give your life, as, as you give from your pocketbook, as you tithe, as you give offerings, as you give your time in all these ways, do it because of the God who makes all things new because this 
will be the way in the heavenly realm with God. All things will be made new. No longer will we be living out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, as Paul says, but living out of humility and love for one another. And so, friends, let me send you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. Amen. Thank you.